what's up? Welcome to episode nine of Mix in America. This one is simply titled The Third Option, which is the name of Pastor Miles McPherson's book, The Third Option. He wrote it a few years ago. Um, It's a great book called The Third Option. And so honestly, um, I've had a lot of talk. I've done a lot of talking and had a lot of conversations uh, during this podcast about different things, my thoughts, my feelings, my opinions, my experiences. And I've been very honest about I don't have the answers for this. Um, I'm just kind of sharing what I think, what I feel, what I've experienced. But honestly, I want to talk about this book because this book, I think, actually has some answers in it, and it's been really good. I've I've read the book. Uh, I've heard Pastor Miles preach about it quite a few times. He was actually the pastor at the church we went to in San Diego. When the book came out, actually, we were living in San Diego, and so we heard him preach about it then. We've heard him do a couple other messages. River Valley here in the Twin Cities is a church uh, locally that had Pastor Miles uh, did a conversation, actually, with their head pastor and Pastor Miles. And I, and I just, I love what he says. I love the way he addresses this. Um, I love the book itself. I recommend to everybody to go buy a copy, read a copy, buy some copies to give away. Um, I have, my wife and I have a couple copies. If you need a copy, let me know. I'll make sure that uh, I can let you borrow one of ours or get, get you a copy somehow because this book is great. It's called The Third Option by Miles McPherson. Um, so I, I really just want to talk about this book today. And that's going to be kind of the, the point of my podcast is I'm going to share some of the, the stuff that I've learned from this book, some of the highlights that I think is good, important, but I'm just going to kind of touch the surface on this. And I'm going to recommend that you go out and read this book for yourself because honestly, it is fantastic. And I think it doesn't just, I think, have the a good point of view on on racial issues in America right now, but I think it actually gives us some practical, real things that we can do to help. And I think that's important because I think as, as important as it is to have all these conversations, which I think is great. There's a lot of conversations happening right now in America, but I still, we got to do something. We can't just be talking about it. It's a great first step, but talking about it can't be the only thing we do. So let's talk about this book for a little bit. It's called The Third Option. He titled it The Third Option, he said, because everything in, in America right now is us versus them, right? Whether it's black versus white, black versus police officers, uh, Republican versus Democrat. And what Miles McPherson is saying here, the third option is it's not choosing one side or the other. The third option in this case is on in the image of God inside of every single one of us. Uh, he said the title comes from, it's a story in in Joshua where he's getting ready to, to take Jericho. And the angel comes to Joshua at night and Joshua says to him, are you for us or for our enemies? And he says, neither. But as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And as a kid... I I grew up in church, right? So I heard these Bible stories and Joshua always, for some reason, appealed to me. I'm not sure why. I always love the story of Joshua. And this, the church, I don't think, I'm not saying it's bad that it intentional, but I think we gloss over that part. Like I, that always caught my attention that he said neither when he asked if you're on our side or our enemy, if you're for us or for our enemy. And I, and the church, I always kind of, we just kept going, right? Because there's a lot happens in that story, right? They march around the walls, the walls come down, they take Jericho go to the promised land, right? There's a lot that happens in that story. So that little detail doesn't get talked about enough, in my opinion. And I think it's a big deal because he says, I'm not for you or your enemy. I'm for the Lord. And I think even in this, where if you grew up in the church like me, you think of the children of Israel as, right? They're God's chosen people. So we're like, that's the side of the Lord. And anybody that comes against them is on the other side. But what this angel says here is, is neither. I'm on the side of the Lord, and obviously he gives him instructions for how he can take the city. So he gives him instructions that are for him, right? For his benefit. But it's not like he's saying, I'm on your side. He's not like I'm saying, I'm I'm one of the Israelites. I'm, I'm on this side versus the other. I'm on the Lord's side. And so the third option, what he's talking about is it doesn't have to be always us versus them, right? Everybody wants to paint this narrative of us versus them. Which side are you on? Are you for the police or are you supporting the black community? Are you a Democrat or a Republican? And it's always like one side or the other. And what the third option is saying is you don't have to pick one side or the other. You should be on God's side. So that title alone could preach a message. Fantastic. Um, But I want to go into a little bit about what this book actually talks about. For me, the biggest takeaway from this book is what he calls uh, your in groups and your out groups. He explained it this way. Pastor Miles, if you don't know, is a former NFL player played for the Chargers for a few years and he was telling the story about he was working out at a gym and another guy came in who was a professional hockey player. 
So he was talking to this guy and he was saying that this guy, they were in the same in group as professional athletes, right? That's a very exclusive in group. There are not a lot of people, you know, you look at the percentage of people in the world, the percentage of them that actually make it to be a professional athlete is very small. So they have a, they have that in common. They have a very tight fraternity of people who make it to play professionally in their sport. So that was his in-group, right? In that scenario, those two were in the same in-group. But then he broke it down and said, but he plays professional football. The guy played professional hockey. So they have an out-group there because the guy started talking. They were talking about sports and playing professional sports. They all got along. They could talk about that. They had a lot in common. Once the guy said something about hockey, Pastor Miles had no idea what he was talking about. Pastor Miles doesn't play hockey. So he's an out-group in hockey. So they have a similar in-group in professional athlete, but then they have different outgroups, hockey versus football. So you see how every single person, we all have in-groups and they overlap different ways, whatever, but we all have in-groups, we all have outgroups. Um, the example that I that I get that it's easy for me to say is Vikings fans. I'm a Vikings fan, right? I'm a Minnesota sports fan. I love all the Minnesota sports team. If you are also a Minnesota sports fan, we have that in-group. When Joss and I did live in San Diego, if I saw somebody else wearing a Vikings jersey or a Vikings hat, I would get excited. I would yell skull across the parking lot. Like we instantly had this connection. You know, we were in San Diego during that 2017 season with Case Keenum and the Minneapolis Miracle. And I remember seeing Viking stuff like a lot, like a lot of Viking stuff all around San Diego. And a lot is relative. But I remember seeing, and every time I saw something, we would all say, you know, what about that game last night or whatever? Like we we're so excited about, about being and I, and I love that. It's one of the things I love about sports. You know, in the cities, obviously, there's Vikings fans everywhere uh, and Twins fans and, and Wild fans and, and Timberwolves fans. But but it was so cool seeing my in-group in San Diego. So my in-group, let's say Vikings fans, my out-group would be Packers fans. When I see a Packers fan, when I see somebody wearing a Packers jersey or Packers hat, I instantly think a certain way about them. And I instantly like get a, you know, a little bit sick in my stomach a little bit when I see the, the that green and yellow combination together. Um, obviously kind of lighthearted having fun with this, but, but that's my out group. Right. And so what he, what he, what pastor miles talks about with in group is your in group bias. And we automatically have an in group bias, right? If I see somebody wearing a Viking shirt, automatically connect automatically like him, we're going to be friendly towards each other. Right. A Packers fan, I'm automatically going to have a disconnection from I remember when I was in college in Oklahoma and you go to college out of state, you don't know anybody, you know, the first semester is basically just meeting everybody. Hey, where are you from? What's your major? And for me, when I met people, the first thing I always say, where are you from? And then I say, are you a sports fan? Because for me, if you're a sports fan, we can have a connection, right? Again, that's my in-group. I like sports. I can talk sports all day long. We instantly have that connection. If you say no, that's fine. We can still have a conversation. We're just, I just know it's going to be a little bit more work. We're not going to connect as easily. It's okay if you're not a sports fan. But for me, I knew that I would have that connection right away. But let's say I met somebody from Wisconsin and I say, oh, you're not a Packers fan, are you? And then they would say, if they said yes, then I understand that, okay, there's going to be something we got to work through in our relationship, right? We're probably, if, if we're going to be friends, we're going to have to deal with this. Automatically, that's my out group being a Packers fan. I know too many people that are Packers fans. They might be upset by this right now, but, but believe me, the Packers fans that I know understand this relationship because they know that again, our in group of being football fans, we are an out group of Packer fans. I don't care if it's friends, family, coworkers, whatever it is. It's a great example of an in group and an out group and an in group bias. So a couple of things that he talks about with in group bias besides, all right. So I think you understand that now you guys should understand in group bias. Um, but a couple of things, if we get along better with our in-group, right, automatically, and we give more leeway to our in-group, right? We've been talking Vikings and Packers, but obviously let's make this more real. We're having conversations about race. You are going to give more leeway, more forgiveness to people who look like you, think like you, act like you, talk like you. It's natural. It's normal. It's it's a part of life. It's the way that we are, right? So, so that's one of the things I hear with conversations with people uh, when they want to have these racial conversations. They come in right? Telling white people that they're racist, right? People don't want to hear that. Not only is it, it probably not true. Cause I don't think most white people are racist, but you're going to offend them and you're going to upset them. And you're, they're not going to listen to anything you say after that. So if you start the conversation with all white people are racist, you lost them. 
and you can't have a healthy conversation. But I don't care if you're white, black, orange, yellow, green, blue, pink, or purple, you have in-group bias. And whatever your in-group is, you're going to treat them better than your out-group. Now, the challenge here is in handling race relations is to treat people of your out-group more like your in-group. But before you do that, you have to be consciously aware that in-group bias exists and that you need to go out of your way and put forth effort to treat your out-group like that because in-group is going to happen automatically. So that's in-group bias. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Hopefully you understand what I'm saying. Uh, if not, we can have a conversation about it or better yet, read the book that Pastor Miles wrote. To me, that was the biggest takeaway is this, this idea of we all have in-group bias. Another big takeaway from this book for me is... The, the idea of white privilege. And I address this quite a bit in my white privilege podcast, so I'm not going to talk a lot about it, but I do want to say that I learned that from this book. And the example that Pastor Miles used, if this if you didn't listen to the white privilege one, the example that he used to explain white privilege is uh, he's left-handed. So the world that we live in is set up by right-handed people for right-handed people, right? Uh, maybe it's not that big of a deal, but uh, notebooks, um, scissors, your desk at school, maybe if you had one that had a little arm that came out, uh, everything is kind of set up for right-handed people. I'm right-handed, so I don't even think about it. Scissors work just fine in my hand. I've never even thought about it. The point of this is, if you're right-handed, you don't know the struggle that left-handed people go through. And you don't even think about it. Like, it never ever crosses my mind unless I'm talking to Jocelyn specifically or when Pastor Miles mentions this or read it in his book that left-handed people have it more difficult because the world was not set up for them. So so because I'm right-handed, I don't notice that, right? I don't even think about it. I don't know. And he says that this is creates what we what he calls blind spots. A blind spot is just simply something you don't know. And what he talks about in this book is is addressing and acknowledging the fact that you might have blind spots. You might not know everything. Um, the way that I see the what this means to me, what this stands out to me, what I think of when he says, when he talks about blind spots is things that people say that they don't understand are racist, are offensive. And they'll say something like you people or um, all you guys look alike and stuff like that, that they don't understand is offensive and they say it. And so then what happens is they say it and then somebody calls them out on it and they say, well, I'm not racist. And then it goes back and forth. And so the first thing is there are going to be things that you may not understand, especially if you're white from the suburbs and don't have a lot of racial interactions in your life or haven't had a lot, right? Just like me as a right-handed person doesn't understand, doesn't think about what it means to be left-handed because I don't have to deal with it. So you might not have ever had to deal with racism in your life. So you don't think about it a lot. So that's okay that you don't understand it all. That's okay that you don't know certain things that might be offensive. And then the idea is, what he's saying is, you could say something offensive, but it doesn't make you racist. You might say something that you think is just a normal thing to say, and you don't realize how much it hurts people. So so one, if if you say something like that and someone calls you out, understand that just because you said it doesn't make you racist. But how you respond to them calling you out can go a long way. Your response there says a lot and you need to say, oh, I'm sorry I offended you. I didn't mean it like that. Thank you for letting me know about my blind spot. Thank you for letting me know that this was wrong. Because if nobody ever tells you it's wrong, how are you ever going to change? How are you ever going to do anything different if nobody actually calls you on it? So how you handle that correction makes a huge deal. I think a lot of our problem with racism, at least in my world, what I experience, right? Where I go to church, where I work, where I uh, grocery shop, the friends and family that I interact with, what I would say racism was what I would call accidental racism or something that's just out of ignorance. And, And people say something they don't realize is offensive. And then somebody responds, lets them know that's offensive. And then they get all defensive and say, well, I'm not racist. And then this person says, well, you are because you said this. Well, no, you're not. So that's where I see a lot of tension. That's where I see a lot of things that need to be fixed. So I think in all of these discussions and whether you are black or white or a cop or a civilian, whether you are native or your family immigrated here at some point in time, whether recently or generations ago, is this understanding of we all have blind spots and we all have things we don't know at all. 
And when we have these conversations, which I think are hugely important, if you haven't got that from, from me already, the, having these conversations are huge, but you have to go into these conversations understanding that you might have a blind spot, understanding that the person might have a blind spot. So you might need to be more patient with the person you have a conversation with, because if a white person comes up to you and they want to have a conversation about this, you have to understand that they don't know everything. And you have to go in understanding, giving them some patience and some leeway. Again, giving them that leeway, giving them the forgiveness, the patience that you would as if they were in your in-group, even if they're not. The last thing that I want to say about this third option book is there's a lot of good stuff in there, right? So all these things that I mentioned, there's even more. Uh, he goes into obviously more detail about all this stuff. Uh, he explains a lot. But the best thing about this book probably is the practical application to it. And and the one thing that that really stood out to me that I think is really important that I think all of you should do is this takeaway that he says. And first thing you should do is buy the book because this is going to give you a lot more information. But the second thing that I would tell you to do, and you'll get this homework if you read the book, but he does give them some homework and he, he calls them, I forget exactly what he calls them, um, but basically racial field trips. And this is something that every single one of you can do, right? Especially after George Floyd, a lot of people are talking about um, race, having conversations, but a lot of people are wondering, what can I do? How can I help, right? Um, I'm sure there's uh, politics you can get involved in. You can write letters to your your senators and your congressmen and your uh, local authority, and you can get involved in groups, and you can and you can find out what you can do in your own community, whether it's your your church, your school, your job. Find ways that you can help implement change within your own uh, circles of influence. But this is one thing that every single person can do. Basically, you go somewhere where you will be the minority, right? Uh, this is specifically if you are white from the suburbs. This is hugely important because you might not ever know what it feels like to be a minority because you've never been in a situation where you're the only white person in the room. But go to, he talks about some a guy that went to, a, a white guy that went to a black barbershop. You can go to um, the Asian part of town. You can go to, you can go to like a Mexican celebration like Jocelyn talked about growing up, going to like quinceaneras and that kind of stuff. Um, go experience other cultures and experience what it's like to be different. It's important for everyone to experience different cultures. I think it's a really good thing. So number one is to experience other cultures, but number two is to to know what it feels like to be the minority and not like a, oh, it's a big deal. Or I'm not telling you to go to like a bad neighborhood where you're going to get shot. I'm just saying go somewhere where you feel a little out of place, where you feel a little uncomfortable, right? How often do we in America actually go out of our way to feel uncomfortable? We do everything we can to be comfortable. Um, if you are a minority though, you know what it's like to be uncomfortable, to be the only one like you in the room. But if, if you are white and you go up around all and you live around all white people, then you don't know what it feels even for a second. So I'm just saying, take an afternoon, take an hour. If you're white, go to an all black church. So I, I just encourage you. That's, that's one practical thing that you can do in all of this. If you're like, how can I heal America? Th this isn't going to heal everything, right? This isn't going to fix racism one time, but but I think if, if as many people as can do this, the better off we're going to be as far as race relations in America. So again, I have two practical takeaways for you from this. One is to go get the third option by Pastor Miles McPherson. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it on, I think his website is milesmcpherson.com. So I, I highly encourage you to read this book. Um, and I'm in, in a, we just started a diversity committee at our church and I'm a part of it. And that's one thing I recommend is that everybody reads this book. Um, as a, as a starting point, and actually they, the church paid for uh, people to to get the book if they wanted it, and so there's, um, it's a great way to start these conversations. It's a great, uh, practical, real thing to to work towards solutions because a lot of what I talk about is just thoughts, feelings, opinions, experiences, um, but this book actually has some solutions. Again, not saying it's going to fix everything, but um, but it's good, and I really encourage you to read it. And then second, take that racial field trip. Go somewhere where you're the minority, where you're in your out group. So that's it for today. That's all I wanted to talk about. Uh, read the book, take the field trip. Um, I just thank you guys for listening uh, today. Thank you guys for those of you that are listening. Um, you know, I'm not someone that's going to kind of plug myself or try to um, advertise for myself or ask you for, for likes or follows or shares or anything like that. But if you do if you are encouraged by this, if you do think this is a good conversation to have, then tell people about it, share it with people. 
Uh, obviously I think it's pretty good because I'm the one talking about it and this is how I think and feel. And, um, I think these conversations are important. So feel free to tell people about this, share this with people. Um, and let's have conversations. If you know me, talk to me. Uh, I'm not afraid to have any of these conversations in, in public, uh, with people. Um, so I'm not afraid to, to talk about the difficult things, to have the difficult conversations. And honestly, if you want to be on the podcast, if you have some stuff that you want to say, whether it's because you agree with me or you disagree with me vehemently and you want to argue with me, I probably won't argue back, but I'd love to hear your side of the story. I'd love to hear uh, your experience. I'd love to hear uh, your part of the conversation. So if you know me and you want to be on this, reach out to me. Uh, even if you don't really know me that well, um, let's have a conversation. Let's talk about it. Reach out to me. Again, thank you guys so much for taking the time to listen to this, to listen to these last uh, nine episodes. Episode 10 will come out next week. I already recorded it with my cousin, Kellen. Uh, he is mixed like me. Our moms are sisters. Uh, so he also has a black mom and a white dad. Grew up uh, just outside of Chicago for most of his life. Uh, we've had some good, we had a good conversation about uh, what it's like in corporate America, um, not just for minorities, but specifically being mixed um, and and not being fully black or fully white. Um, some of the same stuff that we, that we talk about um, that he's had similar stories to me or, or things like me, but then some stuff we disagree on as well. So I think you'll really like this conversation that we have. Um, that'll be next Monday. Join me for episode 10 of Mixed in America. Hey, thanks for watching my video. I hope you liked it. If you did, can you do three things for me? Can you like the video, subscribe to my channel, and tell your friends.